One of the great things about drinking vintage teas is that the world was a cleaner place then and you don't have to worry about pesticides or pollution, things like that. It's a tea from a clean earth, from a clean time. The magical thing about Leopau is that it has the ability to uh, expel heat and dampness uh, in Chinese medicine. It expels dampness and heat. Leopau is a place, is a place in Guangxi. Uh, and Leopau means six castles. At some time, probably in the distant past, there was six castles there, but Chinese castles were more like what we would call in English forts because they were made from wood. They weren't made from stone, so fort is a better is a better word for what they were. They, and and so they didn't they didn't they don't survive the way that castles do in Ireland or Scotland or Spain or right. So they're not there anymore. So, uh, but the place is still called six six forts, six castles, and the tea from there has, like I said, its own unique heritage going back centuries and uh, maybe even millennia. We don't know. Red tea is oxidized, heavily oxidized pre, during production. Black tea is post-production artificial fermentation. So black tea is fermented. Leopau is fermented. That's the main difference. So Leopau is a black tea. When Malaysia was British controlled, the British, they thought that the Malaysians were in their stereotype lazy. Maybe they didn't work in the way that the British wanted or whatever, but that was all colonialism anyway, so whatever they say about them is, is suspect, right? But for, for that reason, they brought over a lot of Indian and uh, Chinese migrant workers. Um, because they controlled much of those places too. And so for the most part, not exclusively, but for the most part, a lot of the Indians worked on plantations and a lot of the Chinese worked in mines. There's, there's tin mines. There's a lot of, there was a lot of tin mining in Malaysia, largest tin mines in the world. The miners wouldn't work for a mining company if the mining company didn't provide Liu Bao tea to drink because it's already a dangerous job going in those days. It's not like mines were safe. They were very dangerous. And in, this pla and in Malaysia where there's heavy rains and it's very humid and down there in the, in the, it's very hot and humid down there in the, in the mines, so they drank the Liu Bao to expel the dampness and heat so they didn't get sick. And then as that trend took off, the like, you know, good businessmen, any good businessmen eventually are going to realize that to buy wholesale. You know, so for example, if you, if you work in an office building and you have 700 employees in that office building and you have to provide coffee for all of them, every day, eventually somebody's going to realize we need to buy coffee and coffee filters in bulk. And so there's probably going to be a room in that office that's filled with like huge boxes of coffee and coffee filters because the company, by providing coffee every day, by buying it wholesale, they're going to save thousands of dollars over the course of a year. So the same thing happened. These mining companies started buying lots of Leopold, like having warehouses of it you know, in the, in the back for, for saving money. And uh, then when the mines close, there's a lot of it left over. And so most of the old Liu Bao is in Malaysia. Liu Bao is, is, comes in usually big 50 kilogram baskets, like this one on the cover right here. This is a 50 kilogram basket. It's big, very big, very big. Uh, the, the main reason being that back in the day, Liu Bao tea was not worth very much. So you had, they had to sell large quantities just to make, any, make it worthwhile at all. Because it was a very, very uh, cheap tea. In fact, when I first started drinking tea in the mid-90s, uh, we used to call very, very old Liu Bao poor man's poor. Because uh, even though in those days poor was so cheap compared to what it is now, it wasn't you know, it wasn't cheap for an ordinary person. It wasn't like it was, uh, you know, you didn't have to spend money to get it. I, 
I, I think my first, for example, my first cake of red mark, I paid uh, 8,000 NT, which would have been like 250 roughly US dollars, which compared to now, because now it costs tens of thousands of US dollars. So when you think of that, wow, $250 is super cheap. But at the same time, when you're young and in your 20s, $250 isn't cheap for a cake of tea. Right? That's expensive. If you're buying a cake of tea right now for $250, that's a, probably an, you're, you're spending a lot on a cake of tea, more than you usually do. So it wasn't, it wasn't but Liu Bao at that time was super cheap. Um, it also is not anymore. Uh, it's more expensive now. Uh, but most of the Liu Bao, uh, all the, almost all the Liu Bao went to Hong Kong and then also to Malaysia. Do you think I can find a book in, if I went to an, a, a bookstore in Ireland, do you think someone's written a book on, on toothpaste? Probably not. It's just not, probably not, because it's just not something that somebody, because it's such a day-to-day -day thing, you see? It was such a day-to-day -day part of life, Leo Pao, in Malaysia. So, and even now, when you go to Malaysia, if you look in the magazine, there's uh, one of the articles is a trip to Malaysia, and it has this section here where, like, it's, it says, right, strolling through the streets of Ipo and stopping to peruse the old shops, you'll, you notice that Leo Pao seems not to belong exclusively in tea stores. It appears in all sorts of places, from seafood merchants to variety stores and paper puppet studios. The store owners explain that Liopao is such an everyday commodity that you can buy it and drink it everywhere. It's not just the purview of tea merchants. We really got the feeling that Liopao tea has planted itself into every corner of the local people's lives. So you can find, this is a picture of a, of a shop that is selling um, paraphernalia for praying. So this is ghost money for burning... And there's incense probably in there and maybe some statues. So it's a, like a store for, uh, for your altars, for your altar supplies, right? For Chinese people to, they burn ghost money for their deceased ancestors. So they have money in heaven and they burn incense. And there's you know, probably some other things like that in there. Firecrackers also they light off on during holidays, etc. And, and maybe there's some, some deities in there, some statues as well. Some, uh, we say rupa. Right? Some rupa. But here's Liu Bao tea being sold there as well. And so you, you, know, and you, so you can see it in all kinds of shops in, in, in Malaysia, everywhere. So it's such a day-to-day -day thing. Like, you know, there's not, there's not, the history and the study of it is all very modern. The first book on Liu Bao tea just came out in the last 10 years. The processing of, of Liu Bao tea has changed a lot over time. Uh... The oldest tea there is called uh, Lao Cha Po, which means like grandmother tea. And they would just pick the, the trees there are, there's, there's typically two kinds of tea trees. These are very rough categories. But one we call big leaf and one we call small leaf. Looking at the leaf doesn't really tell you what kind of tree it came from because a big leaf tea tree also has small teeny buds. And a small leaf tea tree, the leaves can also grow. Right? But once the leaves are full grown, a big leaf tea tree will have much bigger leaves up to this big. Little big ones right there. It's dried right there. Do you see it? So they can be, they're very big and the small leaf is small. Uh, the original tea is big leaf. Big leaf tea trees are also called chao mu. They have a single trunk and they typically branch about a meter after, uh, above the ground. But they can branch even like 20 meters up. It depends on the, on the species and varietal, etc. Location. And they have roots that mostly go down. So as tea moved north, it evolved more into like a bush with many trunks and roots that kind of go outward and smaller leaves. And the further north you go, the smaller the leaves get until you get to Japan. They're so small when they're rolled, they're like little needles, right? So the colder the weather, the smaller the leaves. So like that. Liu Bao technically is, we could say, a medium leaf. It's right near Yunnan, so it's coming more, it's, it's more of a chao mu, it's more trees, uh, and it's uh, a little bit less uh, of a small leaf. In the, this issue, we have uh, stories about the uh, origin of Liu Bao, some legends and, and myths and things. But this uh, Lao Cha Po, this grandma tea, 
they were basically very simple. They just take the teas, the big leaves, they pick them. It's almost like Yunnanese bao bao cha, which I love. The wrapped leaves that the Aboriginal people often carry in their coats and stuff. And when you meet them, they're like, Vroom, they pull some out and put it in a little bowl or pot. I love that stuff. But it's kind of like that. They would kind of boil the tea and then they would just wrap it with string and let it dry from the rafters. And that was the simplest, like old school version of how Leopa was drunk, maybe even thousands of years ago. We don't know. The local people think that it was many, many centuries, if not thousands of years, that they've been drinking the tea. And then when actual production began in the, like I said, late 19th century, early 20th century, the tea was produced uh, by steaming. Basically, I had three steamings. One steaming was to, de so it was, it was de-enzymed in that way. So the firing was done through steaming, like sencha. That's Japanese sencha is de-enzymed, Japanese green tea is de-enzymed with steaming. That's why it has such a particular flavor. Um, so it was steamed to de-enzyme. Then it was steamed to ferment it, to initiate fermentation. And then it was also steamed for compression. It's not really compressed, it's just they, want, they would, wanted to like stuff the 50 kg into a small basket as it can. Typically after the tea's aged in those baskets, it comes out in, in usually three to four pieces. Like, blomp, blomp, blomp. but they, they weren't like intentionally crafted pieces. They're just, that's how, what the basket has a bunch of loose leaf tea in it. And then it has typically four discs, big, like 12 kg discs, 10 to 12 kg discs. So, um, like that. So that's how it was produced up until 1958. And then they started piling. They started piling the tea, uh, putting water, and, uh, and they stopped steaming. So they started firing like other tea, using wok firing, and, and, and they started piling. So the piling was done to ferment the tea, which is essentially like composting. You pile the tea and you spray it with water, and, to, and it ferments that way. And that, studying that, is study, mostly it was the study of Liopao that created Shopur in the 60s and 70s. So in the 60s and 70s, uh, the tea factories in, in Yunnan wanted to artificially ferment tea. Their intention was to recre recreate what it takes nature 70 years to do in a shorter period of time. Because it takes nature 70 years to fully ferment. That's what's full maturity in Shopur, naturally fermented pur. Sheng is naturally fermented, Shou is artificially fermented, right? So in naturally fermented pur, 70 years is full maturity. That's a long time. They wanted to do that quicker. Obviously, they weren't successful at that. You don't recreate what nature does in 70 years in a few months or a month. So, but they were successful in creating a new genre of tea. Then, in the 80s, the processing of show as show because show uh, uh, fermentation is so much dependent on local microbial life. Microbes are a part of the terroir, very much so. It's why you know famous alcohols throughout history have tried. People have tried to replicate them elsewhere, but couldn't because they didn't understand microbes. Didn't have a, even the knowledge that microbes existed. So, for example, the most expensive uh, liquor in China is called Mao Tai, and people have tried to replicate Mao Tai throughout China for centuries, and they couldn't just like people have tried to replicate champagne or beers in Germany. But you can't because they didn't know, but they, now they know that the local uh, microbial uh, ecology is different. And so when, they got, when this processing got to Yunnan, it evolved and changed and adapted to suit Yunnanese leaves, which are different. But that processing, they developed skills and techniques that enhanced the tea and sped it up. And so they have developed techniques to make it more efficient and industrial. They also developed techniques to make it better, better tea. And both of those then came back to Liopao and influenced Liopao in the 80s. And in the 80s, in Liopao, they started making deeper piles and spraying them with water and doing just like Shopur. So that brings us to our expansion pack and why this expansion pack is important and what we're going to, uh, what we're kind of do experiencing today, which is that the first tea that we're drinking is an 80s tea, and it's after that change, after show influenced Liopao tea, and they started making deeper piles. And so you drink this tea, and you get the piling flavors of show. This might taste like a show pour to you, right? You, in fact, I could have probably tricked you and said this was a show, and you wouldn't have known, right? Because it has a lot of very, very typical show pour flavors. And so it has those elements of camphor 
and the piling flavors, the dui wei, we say, the f f flavor of the piling, and the, the kind of thick, billowy, uh, heavily fermented flavors, right? And then the second tea that we're going to drink is a 70s Liu Bao, and so it's before that. So we're going to shift back to before show influence to when the piling was lighter and there's more of the traditional Liu Bao characteristics in the tea, right? There's more of, it's more of a, a which, you know, like for example, Liu Bao tea is dried with pine wood, so it has a pine smoked flavor. That's one of the defining characteristics of Liu Bao tea. And you can't really taste that too much in this tea because of that heavy artificial fermentation. It's there, but it's more subtle. And there's other flavors competing with it. But when we move to the second tea in the 70s, we can, we can uh, experience the typical Liu Bao flavor a little bit more. So by drinking these two teas, you're drinking on either side of a big historical change and you're having an experience of, of that. And uh, that's what this, the, this, uh, the idea of the expansion pack is about. We taste history. We taste those changes uh, in the heavier fermentation, deeper piles, wetter piles, wetter, heavier fermentation, more aggressive fermentation that's happening quicker. I would rather, I would rather have, uh, have a public tea ceremony and have 20 out of 27 people say, wow, that tea session really transformed me. I really dropped in. I went into a meditative space. I connect with my heart in a way that I haven't in a long time. I would rather have people say that than have 20 out of 27 people leave my tea session and say, wow, that tea sure was delicious. Tasted kind of like mushrooms to me. Oh, no, no, I, don't, I think it was more like my grandma's kitchen. <laughs> but, but anyway, it was delicious, real tasty. That, I, I, that's less meaningful to me, ultimately. But the goal is always nutritious and delicious. <laughs> so, ideally we want both.